link to the recording. Of course, of course. Yes, of course, yes, yes, of course. Yes. So, everybody, uh, welcome to Radical Anthropology. <clears throat> um, this evening we have a most distinguished speaker, Professor Nurit Bird david of uh, the University of Haifa, of, of Haifa, Professor of Anthropology there. Um, and Nurit has made a, a very big impact on anthropology, um, much more than most of us, in fact. And Archie, uh, of course, done uh, many years of field work among the Nayaka of South India, going right back, I think, to the 70s. And um, <clears throat> possibly she's best known for restoring a, a classical concept from anthropology, which is animism. It was completely out of fashion for most of the <laughs> early part of the 20th century, and even the later part of the 20th century. And um, she's reminded us of the crucial importance of um, non-material or non-human agents uh, in actually all societies, but in particularly uh, among hunters and gatherers. Um, and she's going to be talking about the importance of these um, members of your community, which are kind of supernatural, but which nevertheless have a huge, um, a huge influence. Um, and alongside that, she's um, well known for stressing the problem of anthropologists who are scale blind, who kind of don't recognize the enormous effects of changes of scale on all the dynamics of any social system. Um, so, um, and, and, and further, in more recent times, she's been <coughs> kind of, I think, carrying on her work among small scale intimate societies by looking at homemaking in modern Western, uh, of course, in, including is, uh, Israeli society. So uh, it's, her, her work is about intimacy, personal relationships, and the crucial importance those have um, for uh, all of us. I, there's a lot more I could say, but <laughs> let's, let's leave the um, uh, room open to, um, to Nurit. <clears throat> okay, off, um, go for it, Nurit. <clears throat> okay. So, thanks for inviting me, and I'm really glad to be with you, even if it's on Zoom. Uh, what I miss in the face-to-face -face contact, I actually see you in your homes, which is lovely for me. Mm. Uh, this talk is based on a, an article that will soon be published in the French journal Le Homme, in a special issue named uh, The Ends of Egalitarianism, co-edited by uh, Natalia Petron Arias and Hans Steinmuller, and I thank them both very much for the generous help with, with developing this paper. Now, Chris suggested that I fully talk uh, at least the first few minutes and then read the paper. I choose, I do it the other way around because I want to be exact in how I introduce what I will be doing and then I will talk more freely. So basically, um, uh, I, the paper is much longer and I condense it to almost a third, so I'll, ch I'll, I'll say what I keep out. So in Galitarian, Hunter-Gathers has been a central and, and productive analytical category for 40 years. I think we can celebrate now 40 years since 1980. Um, but as any good analytical category, it foregrounds some aspects on expense of others. And what I invite us to do today is to think together about whether and what we can gain by questioning and going beyond this season category. I talk here as an ethnographer who studied a forager group of the egalitarian hunter-gatherer type, the Nayaka of South India, and second, as a cultural anthropologist, focusing on hunter-gatherers own senses of themselves and their world, that is their own ontologies, epistemologies, and cosmologies. And I'll be very happy for you to bring into the discussion your diverse perspectives, not least on the evolution of society. Uh, the main thrust of my argument is that conceptualizing such people as egalitarian entangles our understanding of their worlds with modernity's economic and political language and concerns. Furthermore, 
it entangles our understanding of them with a modern conception of social life as lived by individuals in a society of humans. Now, the category is great, and my intention is not a wholesale critique of it. Uh, it has contributed a great deal to our understanding of both modern society and comparatively of modernity. Rather, I want to explore what can be gained from traveling the category that has remarkably survived for 40 years, outlasting significant developments in hunter-gatherer study since then. So I will first remind us how central and influential has been today the category egalitarian hunter-gatherer society and its origin in James Woodbourne early 1980s work. I will then direct your attention to three particular themes addressed in recent decades, especially as first to hunter-gatherer animism and their kinship and the social scales of practice and imagination, which are actually embedded into their understanding, their kinship and animism. This aspect are missing in the formulation of the egalitarian hunter-gatherer society category, understandably, because this category was formulated before we started to be interested in this aspect. Uh, and, and they're missing the lack, provoking significant uh, consequences. And finally, I will propose a concept that can encompass both what Woodbourne importantly observed and these three or mainly two aspects, a concept that I take from our age, our age of digitally based social phenomenon and language, peer-to-peer -peer society or peer-to-peer -peer cosmos. The digital age idiom peer-to-peer comes from a world far removed from that of hunter-gatherers, but no less, no more so than the modern age, language of hierarchy, egalitarianism, capital, labor, and property that underlie envelope the discussion of uh, hunter-gatherers as egalitarian society. The paper basically presents what I hope to continue developing which is a project aiming to conceptually capitalize on currently emergent digitally based social phenomena in language, as we have done before on modern language and social phenomena, to understand both hunter-gatherers and comparatively something about our digital age. So I start and I'll try to less read, but uh, so I'll start with the hunter-gatherers egalitarian construct, construct and I very briefly, everything here is done briefly because I condense a huge paper into a few moments. So I start with the origin of the category and the idea itself of an egalitarian society as a social political type has deep roots in uh, anthropology. In contemporary hunter-gatherers, it is commonly tracked back to James Woodbourne's seminal article egalitarian societies. In this article, James Woodbourne compared the Hadza of Tanzania, where he had conducted fieldwork, with the Kung of Southern Africa, the Mbuti of Central Africa, the Batek of Southern Asia, and two groups who live in uh, South India, Palian and Pandoram. Uh, the Nayaka live not in the same, uh, roughly in the same area of South India as these two groups, and share many similarities with them. So in, so in many ways, Nayaka can and I have regarded them as egalitarian hunter-gatherer society in the past. Now the influence of the category is quite amazing. Uh, it really has been immense. One simply cannot overemphasize its influence. Ethnographers now use it to introduce their study group and its reference uh, groups. Scholars in the field of social, biological, ecological, archaeological, and evolutionary anthropology pursue questions connected to it. For example, what economic, political, and evolutionary uh, mechanisms support hunting gatherers egalitarianism? What can we learn from these structures on human possibilities and potentials? And on how we developed as humans? How and why has equality evolved 
and being succeeded by hierarchy in human society and more and more and more. Woodburn already argued in 2005 that egalitarian hunter-gatherer societies, I quote, constitute the simplest known forms of human social system. Others like Christopher Bohm, Bohm, I don't know how to pronounce it, Bohm, uh, exported it across evolutionary time to the dawn of human society. And Chris and Jerome recently argued that an egalitarian evolution triggered the development of both human symbolic culture and the modern mind. If for a rough measure of the volume of this scholarship, you overlook algorithmic distortion and enter in Google Scholar, egalitarian hunter-gatherer societies, it is astounding. More than 2,400 2, results turn up since 2020, more than 15,000 since 2016, close to 30,000 any time. So it's immensely uh, influential category and great deal of good work was done based on it or inspired or it or with it. So what I do is just, I try to push it a little bit further. And the first thing I want to note is the footnotes, the footprints, sorry, the footprints of modern social political language and concerns on in the definition and the concept. And again, I, I can't stress enough that given its early 1980 origin, it's not surprising at all. What is surprising that despite of it, it is so successful, it is so influential and basically un, 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 unquestioned. So Woodburn introduces category in his very typically enviable, uh, eloquent and clear way. And please note, I, I, I don't, just for this, uh, uh, long citation, I didn't want to use a, a, a presentation. So I will try to intonate the word I want you to draw attention to. Uh, and I already say wealth, power, prestige, access to resources, accumulation, property, saving and control. Uh, all of these words underpin, envelope uh, this category. So Woodburn writes, greater equality of wealth, of power, and of prestige has been achieved in certain hunting and gather societies and in any other human society. This society, which have economies based on immediate rather than delayed return, are assertively egalitarian. Equality is achieved through direct individual access to resources, through direct individual access to means of coercion and means of mobility, which limits the imposition of control through procedures which prevent saving and accumulation and impose sharing through mechanisms which allow goods to circulate without making people dependent upon one another. People are systematically disengaged from property and therefore form the potentiality in property for creating dependence. So what one here presents, uh, these are really clearly a, a modern socioeconomic and uh, political phenomena in language that he draws on and those of his time. The category also, the way he introduced it and the category itself also presuppose a society constitutive of individuals. You hear again and again in his definition, and I'll show in a second a little bit more of it, that he speaks about separate individuals, making society and whole societies themselves that can be compared to individuals within societies societies with societies in terms of their degrees of equality, however defined. Now, this idea of society is a modern construct as well. Uh, we can see it in more detail uh, when we look at game sharing. I mean, this language permeates ethnographic description. It's just that it's theoretical formula, but how we actually describe, how we see what we make of hunting other societies. So, the language that is embedded in the introduction go right down to ethnographic description. And I take one example, game sharing, uh, which is thought to be characteristic of hunter-gatherers and is taken by Woodbourne and many others to be emblematic of their assertive kind of egalitarianism. So Woodbourne argued, and again, note 
with me the language and thematic emphasis, that the hunted game initially belongs to the individual hunter who has killed it. And that is then shared among all group members who are present, enforced by an egalitarian ideology. Game sharing is suggested, disengage people from property while preventing accumulation as a basis of inequality. Sharing consists in redistributive transactions, and I quote, in defined more by political pressures than by personal choices. So again, we hear about what individuals do, individuals who live in a, in a group, and how and why they divide uh, such a game. So let now, I'm now moving to what had happened in Huntigauser's cultural anthropological studies since Woodbourne introduced this really highly influential category that basically survived all that I'm going to describe just now, which is not a, a mean I mean, it's extraordinary success. Mm -hmm. uh, here, Here I really kind of condense and I'll, I'll use just tiny little pieces of ethnography just to make concrete what I'm trying to say because my main concern is to develop the argument and for you to help with me think about it in the best way we can. Uh, so what I will try to argue now that both I will focus on kinship and animism, two themes that received attention in recent decades. And my main emphasis will give will be to just to emphasize their um, relational, connective nature. Um, again, I just start with really brief ethnographic bits as are all presented at much more length in my book from 2017 and in the article that will appear soon. Uh, so birth, birth ideally takes place in the hamlet. Everybody hangs around the hut in which the laboring woman gives birth, attended by two elderly female relatives. All are relatives to be of the newborn. And as such, they are summoned as soon as the, as the labor begins to be there and welcome the newborn into their mix. It's not only the father or mother or whatever, all the community is as much as possible. It's not always possible, of course. But if possible, that's what happened, where they stand, everybody stop what they do, they, they walk two hours, three hours just to be around. And the surprising thing is at the moment the birth is, is done, the, babe, the new baby is out, they go. The main point is to be there when the baby comes out, not any after birth ritual. Uh, if we go to the opposite end of the life cycle, Death is very casually handled, just as Woodbone described for various African uh, hunter gathers. But then ritual take place, very carefully observed. Uh, and the aim is to assure the liminal passage of the deceased, not so much from being alive to being dead, but from being with a community of living relatives to the community of dead relatives. The liminal position of aloneness, this period of a few hours, a few days, when the dead, the deceased, belongs to no community of relatives, this is very dangerous. And the rituals are all done to assure uh, the successful transition. Between birth and death, Nayaka live in a hyper-connected kinship communities. The kinship Density is partly the result of a lot of cross-sibling and cross-cousin marriages, which are very common also among other very small societies. Sometimes they are called the sibling principle. Sometimes they are, uh, they are expressed in sib groups. Partly it is because there is dearth of uh, potential spouses in very small communities. And partly it is because people want to perpetuate their, uh, the, this close network of kin where they grew up. Um, and so in, within the communities throughout their lifetimes, people live with close kin. Um, 
and they are connected to other members, often not just through one route, but uh, various routes that they strategically use uh, to suit their aim. Well, so many, so some members of the NACA band are connected by blood or in marriage links, but in any way, either way, uh, they regard each other as kin and they use kinship terms to address each other and to address their collective. Now the kinship basis of hunter-gatherers group is known and celebrated, elaborated since the 1980s, not the 1960s. Alan Barnard called the systems universal kinship system. Woodburn himself really defined it well, uh, and I quote him, he defined the system as one in which everyone, or at least everyone within the political community is able to define a kinship or quasi-kinship to everybody else. But then, since the 80s, the kinship framework of hunter-gatherers has been overlooked. It went out of a uh, main stage attention. Uh, you really can count on, uh, on one, on two hands, how many anthropologists since it still advance it. And there are two reasons for it. First, the biological and jurical, jural senses of kinship predominated in the mid 20th century, anthropology of kinship. And these senses found, were found missing in hunter-gatherers. For hunter-gatherers, kinship is not about jural status or biological connections. And secondly, I think would, but the success of the egalitarian hunter-gatherers construct, which put all the emphasis on individuals in a group, really kind of uh, push to the back uh, the idea that they are connected. Individuals were the building block of society. Analysis, description, as I said, is done in terms of individuals. So kinship, the kinship links are hardly visible. But there are new trends, new understanding of kinship since the late 1980s. And, and it allows us to look again at kinship and place it back well within uh, analysis and ethnography of hunter-gatherers. Uh, kinship relations are now, the, uh, are now understood uh, as something one does, something one performs, not something one is born to and receive as a status. Kinship depends on constant relating and sharing. And I say, and if you think ship, ship, I, I don't pronounce it well, in kinship, the S-A-S-H-I-P, ship, can be understood both as craft and skill, as in horsemanship, yeah. or as a status, for example, in dictatorship. Now, if you understand kinship in the sense of skill, craft, uh, workmanship, then kinship describes exactly what hunter-gathered kinship is about. It's all about the skills of relating, about connection work. So this connection work, these relations, don't find a way into the construct of egalitarian society. On the contrary, the construct, as it is now, pushes them away from uh, our vision even. So I move to animism and to say that hunter-gatherers live in more than human societies. Again, it's a, a, again, it's since the 1990s that the, the animistic worlds have been, have started to draw attention, as Chris said. And from the hunter-gatherers perspectives, non-humans are also persons. But they're not person in the modern sense of the word. Uh, it, rather, non-humans who demonstrate the ability to socially engage with human, responsibly, res uh, responsibly, uh, uh, responsibly, uh, they're persons. And this meanwhile means that they're also kin, because this is precisely how kin is uh, how kin are defined. So non-human beings who are animated are persons for hunter-gatherers and sorts of kin. Uh, I think human and non-human kinship relations figure amply in hunter-gatherers myths, rituals, 
and everyday life. And again, I just give very, very few examples to make it tangible from the Nayaka. Take this story, for example, my student Daniel Nave, Dr. Daniel Nave, worked with the Nayaka during 2004 to five. And he tells, he heard this story, a forest buffalo found, a forest buffalo cow found an abandoned, an abandoned human baby and she raised a girl. Now the animal mother observed her human daughter's taste for rice and clothes. And what she does is she, she stole it for her daughter from the villagers passing wagons. And there are more stories like that. And this very simple story shows a human non-human kinship relation involving caring, but encompassing very different and taste between the kin. So the kin are not similar, they just care for each other, including recognizing each other's needs and their taste. And not only in everyday life, but in, in stories, but also in everyday life, as among many other hunter-gatherers, Nayaka adopt and take care of very young animals. Nayaka women even ex 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 extract breast milk to, to feed very young animals. So there's a sense of looking after animals and sort of kinship, not just in uh, stories, but in everyday life. And even in the rituals, not only in stories and in everyday life, uh, Nayaka and the invisible non-humans convene, sing, dance, they promise to care for each other, they complain of not being cared for, they demand caring. In all these complementary ways, they do kinship work through connection work with non-humans. So all in all, I summarize this brief, uh, very brief uh, journey through ethnography, the hunter-gatherers appear from this trend to be a heterogeneous society, of all sorts of human, non-human, and a kinship community of humans and non-humans, heterogeneity, connections. Uh, these are major features of the hunter-gatherers as it, they appear from uh, recent work. So the question arises: to what extent the construct of egalitarian society can encompass this, uh, this aspect of the uh, of society. And recently, Marshall, Marshall Salin addressed this very question <laughs> in a very provocative article he published <laughs> in 2017, and it is entitled The Original Political Society. And he argued that since the Newmans are included in the hunter-gatherer society and the non-humans are powerful. Basically, the hunter-gatherer society, when we take it in all its components, human and non-human ones, is very hierarchical because the non-humans are powerful. They govern and rule the humans. The hunter-gatherers is not egalitarian, but to the contrary, hierarchical. It is the original political society. <laughs> It's typical silence, uh, provocative at its best. And there are first ethnographic problems with the argument. Even the little ethnographic snippet that I gave you uh, uh, show, uh, show that the cosmos includes a great diversity of non-humans. I mean, all the uh, powerful and weak, large and small beings whom human adopt and care for like the fledglings, some from whom humans demand consideration and respect, like snake, I, I skip this ethnographic bit, and some who can inflict misfortunes on humans, uh, but, but even those non-humans who inflict misfortunes on humans do not, so, do not do it as a means of coercing or exercising control over humans or ex exercising power. If you carefully an analyze uh, the, the conversation between Nayaka and these superhuman beings, and I think it applies to some extent one way or another in many other hunter-gatherers, these powerful non-humans are powerful in, the, in their nature. They just have power. And they are responding, they are hurt, they are angered by what Nay Nayaka do or what the human do. And their way of responding is through inflicting misfortunes. 
they are expected to contain their anger, to withhold their anger, uh, but it's their nature to express it, and they are blamed and admonished for doing it. Nayaka requests and expects them not to inflict misfortune on them. <laughs> so the non-humans are powerful humans, are powerful beings, and their powerful abilities are expressed, but they do not do this in the animistic world. They, they are not powerful, sorry, they are not political powers. Mm. They are powerful, but they are not powers. They do not enforce a lasting hierarchy, let alone a state or a rule of law in the government of meta-humans as Salin has suggested. So ethnographically, they are powerful beings, but they are not political powers. But there's also another problem with this uh, formulation, besides the ethnographic problems, which is that if you project hunter-gatherers either as egalitarian or hierarchy, the, the argument rests on the same ontological premises, which are problematic. Both types miss out the hunter-gatherers more than human society. Both assume separate beings, compared with respect to their power or any other selected criteria. So both assume they are separate beings, and we can we can compare them. They're the same. They are equal in power, or they are not equal in power. Uh, uh, so both assume separate entities, comparable by one criteria or another, whichever prestige, power, wealth, uh, whatever. The useful term for communicating this uh, idea is commensuration. And this is a concept that predates the concept of egalitarianism and the notion of equality and equal. And it is broadly defined as a comparison of different entities according to a common metric. This is actually an idea that goes back to Greece, uh, fourth and fifth centuries, uh, Plato and Aristot uh, Aristotle actually associated commensuration with the order because values can be prioritized and compared, and incommensuration with chaos and danger. And commensuration comes with ideas of evenness, uniformity, counting, measurements, quantification, abstraction commodification, all of these processes that are associated with the spread of market capitalism and with practices of rationalization and standardization, characteristic of modern state power. Commensuration is necessary for grouping, counting, likening, and differentiating things, but is it applicable to hunter-gatherers? Is it applicable to a community which we said is hyper-connected? People are constituted by their connections. Uh, they are engaged in connection work. They do every, they are heterogeneous. The heterogeneity is a, encompass and afford their connections. This is a whole different construct here than what we describe by uh, egalitarianism or hierarchy. Uh, both assuming some commensuration. So what can we do? How can we go beyond the egalitarian hierarchical opposition? And I, I suggest a peer-to-peer. Uh, again, I can't stress enough how much grateful we all are to the idea of the egalitarian societies, how much inf how inflation has been, and how what we need is to see how we can go a little bit further than it. Um, it seems to reach its limit when we speak about kinship and animism and the social uh, kinship and animism. So how do we go from it? Uh, can we go beyond the limits of classifying hunter gatherers as either egalitarian or hierarchical society and transcend the commensurability that this binary opposite imply? Can we characterize hunter gatherers in a way that doesn't obscure their kinship basis? They're more than human scope, or the incommensurability of their members, yet give expression to what Woodbourne saw so, 
so finely observed what he tries to capture by the idea of egalitarian society. As in the candidate category for the job comes from the lexicon and emergent social forms of our digital age, the age of digitally based connectivity and hyper connections, peer to peer or peer to peer structure. Now peer comes from the Latin par equal, the word peer connotes an equal in rank character or status and at times even a person of aristocratic origin, but it takes another meaning in a phrase that has gained popularity in describing digitally based so-called peer-to-peer structures. The peer-to-peer structures prompts a shift from equality hierarchy problems to issues of connections. It's originally crafted in the field of computing architecture with a more technical sense that I will dwell on here. The phrase has gained popularity for referring to system where users directly connect with one another, the, pl the supported platform of a loop. For example, Airbnb is described as online peer-to-peer short-term accommodation system. So the peer-to-peer -peer structure functions through ad hoc collaboration between various autonomous participants. Uh, and this structure is actually often evoked by scholars and commentators discussing optional non-hierarchical formations and dynamics. So I'm nearly finishing. Mm. One more. Um, so what does a P2P metaphor suggest? An open-ended network, as low as possible a threshold for participation. And most importantly, the fact that participative cooperation itself constitutes one as a peer in the peer-to-peer -peer network. If I use the Airbnb uh, example, the moment I go on the platform and connect the host or guest, I'm there. It doesn't matter if I have a huge house or a small house or wherever I am, I go into the platform, of course, but we don't and and I connect with other members. So the threshold is fairly low and the con connection is with everybody. And by the fact that I participate and connect with other, I'm part of the system. I'm a member of the so-called Airbnb community. So the peer, uh, so cooperate and cooperation and sharing are ad hoc, dynamic and flexible. I can cooperate, I cannot, depends on I have uh, freedom, and this is all a very kind of dynamic uh, process. Uh, the hunter-gatherer P2P structure connects radically different participants, past and present, human and non-humans, bound together by a kinship morality of mutual participation, sharing and care for, not, for one another. So if I extend the, the metaphor a little bit further than I would like to, the platform is the forest we all live in, the protocol of connection is a, behaving as a kin should be, carefully attending to the other. So I ask in the conclusion if uh, the peer-to-peer hunter-gatherer societies uh, can teach us something beyond the limits of their characterization as egalitarian society, equality but of certain kind with autonomy class connections and connectivity. Could the teach us, could the idea of seeing hunting gathers as a peer-to-peer -peer structure teach us something about our possibilities and evolutions as human, about this, the amazing success of platforms like Airbnb and the whole idea of peer-to-peer -peer -peer structures that really spread very fast. Uh, can hunter gatherers show us an option and therefore open a pathway to a world of deep and intense peer-to-peer -peer interconnections between multitudes of essentially different beings? And lastly, could they show us not the original political society, but instead the peer-to-peer, -peer, the original peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem or society? <laughs> Well, quite a lot to think about. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, 
Camilla, Jerome, Ingrid, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as um, possibly. No, Doc can say something about how we misunderstand or use freely the idea of peer to peer uh, system. <laughs> Yeah, I want to. I want to listen what, to what Jerome says first. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. <laughs> well, well. Firstly, uh, thank you, uh, Nurit, for such an incredibly rich rethinking. Uh, which rather, I mean, there's been quite a lot of rethinking of this concept of egalitarianism in in recent years, and you know, so much of it just ignores what is fascinating about the concept and chucks it out and then replaces it with some newfangled uh, idea that forgets all about a whole set of the really key things. And I think what you've done this evening is absolutely beautiful for its encompassing nature. And uh, you've certainly given me lots and lots to think about, which I, I haven't yet been able to pro, uh, process uh, properly. There, I have got some questions written down here. I just need to... Trans, uh, yeah, um, so some of those questions around peer-to-peer. -peer, um, I, sorry, I, I had it in my head just a minute ago, and in talking I've just forgotten it. Um, yeah, so, well, on the one hand, I, I'm very, I, I think you're absolutely, you know, you, you're onto something about peer to peer creating connections between multitudes of different human beings, what you just ended on. And that those, the, the difference, and, and this is something that I find very striking in my own sort of explorations trying to understand uh, egalitarianism better is that it's not any denial of difference. It's quite the opposite. It's a recognition of difference without any status categorization. And it's that which seems to always just get missed by Westerners who come and try and understand what's going on in these societies. Um, and I like very much as well your idea of you know, an open network of connection. And it's that work of connection, of sharing, of demanding things from each other that, that really is at the heart of creating society. Um, I mean, there, there's certain elements of the uh, metaphor you've made with Airbnb, which I find slightly uncomfortable. And I guess perhaps that's where my, my question would be, because underneath the sort of peer-to-peer -peer structures, I mean, look, first of all, I should say that I think your idea of, uh, of thinking about peer-to-peer -peer in the context of hunter-gatherers is, I, I accept, a, a very exciting and interesting thought, which I will certainly be giving a lot more attention to in, in time for moving forward. But in terms of Airbnb, you know, you have an underlying system of profiteering, of making money out of people. And, you know, I've, I've used Airbnb and many times I've been very happy, but sometimes I've been ripped off and I haven't been happy. And, uh, and so I'm just trying, you know, th th there's this profit element, you know, I, I don't know, I've been in various places where people buy all these different flats in blocks and then it's all Airbnb rented out and they've got, you know, a whole system set up to turn those flats into sort of peer-to-peer uh, -peer hotels, if you like. But um, so what I was really just trying to think about was that in hunter-gatherer societies, you do get individual comparison. I know that, you know, if my friends think that someone's got loads more honey than somebody else, you know, they won't stop talking about it. They won't stop going on about how much honey so-and-so had and how little honey they've had and how they're so thirsty and hungry for honey. And, and, um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, to what extent, I mean, all right, I, I accept that they, they're probably two different things, but I'm just wondering to what extent can the kinds of profiteering activities that we are familiar with in peer-to-peer -peer networks of the digital sort, how does that map or, I mean, is it the sort of the demand sharer who, who hides stuff and, and manages to avoid sharing? I mean, it, I'm just trying to get my head around this metaphor and, and the, the big difference yeah. in that. Well, I, the, the Airbnb, the reference to Airbnb was an improv unsuccessful improvisation <laughs> as I was speaking about peer-to-peer -peer, I saw your some faces and I said oh I have to give some concrete example 
so <laughs> it's not written and I just kind of uh, try it's a uh, it's mm. Napster's uh, the idea is just that you don't have center or you have a platform this is a complex issue but you have the, the impression that you can connect with each other. So definitely it's not one-to-one -one analogy, but maybe there is some, some the peer-to-peer insofar as it's direct connections between people, not through a center, and it encompass, because it is based on connection, great diversity, it doesn't matter who connect as long as they connect, uh, I think that's what I want to take with the, from the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, idea. And you find using peer-to-peer -peer in this way in many discussions about present social phenomena, ignoring precisely what you say about the profiteering platform behind it. Uh, Okay. Uh, I don't know, may maybe the forest uh, benefit from uh, <laughs> sharing because then, let, I don't know, I, the, the, the analogy doesn't work on that. What I want to take from it is just these connections, structures based on connections, connections that are ad hoc and spontaneous and can, and can be open-ended, and the main thing is heterogeneity and connections create uh, the structure rather than sameness uh, and yes. quality. Exactly. But, yeah, so yeah. delete, uh, I can't delete the recording, but Airbnb was exactly why I prepare inviting and not uh, <laughs> No, I think you're quite <laughs> correct. Sorry, can I just uh, respond? Because I think that's, you know, it, it really is this uh, important, or the importance of thinking these, these questions through, which, which comes out. And I think you're absolutely right. It's all about connection and creating those connections. And one of the very striking things that I noticed with hunter-gatherers, and this is extremely clear in Central Africa, is how often they target individuals they see are recognized as being powerful or somehow having high status and creating connection with those individuals. So right across Central Africa, all chiefs will have some hunter-gatherers at their court in order to legitimate them in, t in the eyes of their uh, subjects. The hunter-gatherers will be their jokers, their, their, their clowns and buffoons, and, and ones to insult them and tell them what's really going on. But, uh, but will benefit hugely from this very big elephant that they can demand lots of things from. And certainly, you know, in Thailand, if you look at the case of the Manique, uh, they are incorporated in these epic sort of uh, royal myths of, of origin. Um, and, and there very often are, right across the world, these special roles that hunter-gatherers play. Mm -hmm. And it does seem that, you know, you, you, the idea of connection really fits well with that kind of stuff, which is quite difficult to get your head around when you're thinking all about sameness and equality, because clearly they're targeting these very powerful individuals. Um, uh, and, and, and that would uh, fit very nicely. But what I wanted to just end on perhaps, and this may be pushing that uh, Airbnb thing too far, um, and I recognize that uh, you know, that's not really fair, but, but you know, I mean, there's lots of hype about how these sorts of networked ways of individuals interacting are reducing hierarchies, inequalities, and so on. But I mean, do you think that that's just the hype or is there real potential within these new systems for the kind of, and this returns to your point about the, you know, we were hierarchical primates, we discovered egalitarian, or there was a revolution and egalitarianism rejected the alpha males. It enabled encephalization to just phew, suddenly balloon away. And so we became these extraordinarily large brained primates. And then now we're sort of rediscovering our primate instincts uh, and, you know, the, the sort of the march of Trumps and Putins and, uh, and others, uh, you know, this strong man that everyone wants to vote for uh, is really quite uh, remarkable. So, I mean, do you see in the peer to peer uh, sort of blossoming uh, some sort of alternative system emerging, sort of a reconnection in a modern form? Uh, of something of what you're talking about in this hunter-gatherer connectivity? Or uh, is that just, just pushing things too far? Well, uh, first, 
to start with, I think kinship, hunter-gatherers kinship, is the most sophisticated idiom of making connections, which make redundant any platform, organization, system that can benefit from it. I mean, kinship is organized in such a way that it is peer-to-peer -peer structure in its very essence, without any outside the power or whatever. Yeah. Going to Airbnb, I think it is a good example in some ways, because about third of the volume of Airbnb, is, I don't know, now there are 500 million of people used Airbnb, 1.10% of the of human of human population, and if you just take the the middle class who use it, then the enormous proportion. It's more than one and a half than uh, the uh, USA population. Third of it is what is called private room uh, Airbnb, which means that people have free rooms in their homes because the children went away or whatever and they bring Airbnb guests. So if we speak about what I now call be between myself and myself peer Airbnb, present personal private room Airbnb, then we start to, you can't, you can't start to invest, you live there. So you have only so many people and guests coming to you. So the whole uh, vicious circle of hierarchy, capital, huge buildings that are uh, take, rented as Airbnb, all, all companies who handle it one way or another, can't happen on this level of the P Airbnb. So back to your question, I think, yes, every, we are hierarchical. And in every situation, maybe there is these possibilities of, of doing it, uh, going hierarchical but it takes away from the personal uh, kinship basis. Once you do Airbnb at home, it's, it's only home you have. So maybe you have two or three rooms because you have three children who left home, but uh, it's very limited in what you do and you are there. And once you, you are, once the home, the house is commodified, once you don't live in the house, once you don't engage with your visitors, because with Airbnb, you're all the time there. You eat breakfast together, you, and then you start to have the conditions for the kind of higher capitalist, uh, whatever, escalation and hierarchy. So maybe again, scale, growing scale, which means that I can't, in a small hunter-gatherer society, everybody can relate to everybody else. The, when, I mean, the material, reasoning, the uh, neurological reasoning for why hunter-gatherers remain small, uh, small in size. But maybe also this is the one. You can be a kinship community only when you keep your small size. Otherwise, you, you can't know everybody. You can't relate to everybody else. I don't know if it's, again, uh, answer, answer some of the questions, but certainly it's something that we need to think about. Thank you very much, Nurit. Wonderful stuff. Um, I would like I, to come in at some point, but Camilla, you come in well, first. Go, go, go first. Oh, well, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, it's an enormous amount to think about and, and very, very interesting. So I was going to try and see um, what it might say on the kind of evolutionary perspective. I think it's really uh, very, very correct to try to extend or build on James Woodburn's original egalitarian um, societies in terms of kinship, it's, it's really quite, quite correct to see that, that he left it as individuals in that particular article. And also um, his statement about no individual having kind of obligation or relationship or necessary um, obligations to, to others was obviously a very sweeping generalization, which has been significantly challenged, uh, even amongst the Hadza, um, with work by Tiersch Cornes, for instance. Um, so, yeah, that, that idea that you can investigate a society like the Hadza without, without considering kinship um, relations is, is really not going to work. Um, in evolutionary models, 
uh, the idea of peer-to-peer -peer with both kind of human and non-human and, and, and kinship connection, which doesn't necessarily entail biological kinship, um, that the, the models that have been put forward have been counter-dominance, which is uh, Erdl and Whiten, counter-dominance ideas of how, how did egalitarianism, as James Wilburn put it, come to rise, the equality come to rise, um, and there's Christopher Bohm, reverse dominance, as the, the kind of model that you cited as well. Um, now, peer-to-peer -peer fits more with the counter-dominance view that individuals in establishing relationships and kinship, or whatever relationship it is, are reckoning, are insisting that they have equality because they won't, you know, the other person can't you know, put them down in any way. Um, and counter-dominance is a, is a kind of deliberate strategy and, uh, and a deliberate relationship. So it's like counter-dominance includes a kind of kinship connection, if you like. Um, uh, but what, what is so powerful about reverse dominance in addition to counter-dominance is that it entails a notion of collectivity as well as individual strategy, individual linkage. Um, and I'm not sure if peer-to-peer, -peer, how, how can it be developed to generate that collectivity in the sense of us? Now, obviously, Nirit, you've written us relatives. So how does peer-to-peer -peer generate the us? Particularly, how does peer-to-peer -peer establish itself through kind of ritual strategies? Um, or, or, or what comes first there? Um, peer to peer creates ritual, or re ritual creates that? Or I, I just wanted to open that up. Right. Chris, you want to ask and I'll answer to both? I'm I'm happy uh, either way. I, 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 it might might get more done if we if you if we take a couple um if you if you want to because I can I'd like to follow on from that actually um. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of relieved, Nirit, that you are not presenting peer-to-peer -peer as an alternative to egalitarianism, but as a sort of extension and, and development on the basis of this extraordinarily influential and brilliant um, concept that James Woodburn introduced and, and so, so effectively. Um, and, and, you, and, you, but, and you've mentioned, of course, that the peer-to-peer <laughs> elaboration of egalitarianism is to some extent inspired by modern digital forms of communication. And what I fear is that we lose um, the body. Um, digital communication is, of course, bodiless. There's no bodies involved. And even, the, even and of course, the, 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 the metaphor you've used of Airbnb, which I noticed that Doris is, 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 <laughs> is dubbed as possibly couch surfing, when you're couch surfing or doing beam or anything on these platforms, your bodies aren't involved at all. And I'm concerned that some of these emphasis on non-human beings um, and, and, and the emphasis, like, kind of, I don't know, it's, it's like, don't we need the body? We had, a, we had a talk the other week by Mona Finnegan on touch and, and, the, and the extraordinary effect that, that the COVID crisis has had on us when, we're not, when we can only communicate this way through Zoom and things. And this extraordinary importance to all of us of bodily uh, communication, articulate bodies is the, is the, is the, is the formula that, that um, Mona uses. And um, if, we, if, if, we're, if we're trying to do evolutionary anthropology, try to work out what made us human, if you like, as well as what it means to be human, we, we, we have to start from bodies. I mean, there's no, it doesn't seem to be any doubt to me that if you're, if you're studying chimpanzees, for example, you've got, I mean, they're, very, they're obviously very political and engage with each other, but you couldn't possibly deny that this chimpanzee is one chimpanzee and this one is another one and they're getting on or not getting on. So you have to, you're sort of starting with bodies and bodies do tend to be, although connected, they do tend to be, if you like, individuals. And it's only when you get to abstractions that, that these things start to sort of fade. And um, I suppose that's my question. And, and, and linked to that, of course, is that, I mean, you know, David Grave has been, you know, obviously he's been, if anything, more influential since he died uh, a, a couple of months ago than, than when he was alive. But I mean, one, one of the marvelous things he said to us all is, is to sort of really attack anthropology 
In many ways, he says, anthropology seems a discipline terrified of its own potential. It is the only discipline in a position to make generalizations about humanity as a whole, since it's the only discipline that actually takes all of humanity into account, yet it resolutely refuses to do so. And, and I'm not expecting us to sort of talk about liberty, equality, and fraternity. That may be going too far down that political road, but egalitarianism has some of that, has some of that political impact. And it does seem, it does seem important not to collude with, a, with, a, with sort of terminology, which is gonna sort of distance the findings of anthropology, in particular hunter-gatherer studies, distance those findings from having some kind of meaningful impact, political impact in the, in the, in the present world. And I just fear that peer-to-peer is, is too, not just disembodied, but too depoliticized. Um, and obviously I'm not in favor of politics dominating anthropology, but I do think politics may be informed by and shaped by anthropology if it's to be any good. And the, and the more we sort of try to connect up with some kind of political, I know you, your whole point is that we need to sort of disengage hunter-gatherer studies and other you know, forms of anthropology from, from too much entanglement, as you put it, with, with our present concerns. But isn't it quite important that in the present situation, I think Jerome was touching on this with all these Donald Trumps around, isn't it quite important that we actually learn politically from hunter-gatherers? So too much distancing and disentanglement may not be good. <laughs> um, I, will, I will answer now because it will be... Peer-to-peer, yes. um, -peer, first, peer-to-peer -peer and the idea of collective. I mean, peer-to-peer -peer is precisely, or us relatives, relative in the nice sense, all these people are connected. Mm -hmm. It's a collective that is not defined by boundaries. And it's mm -hmm. not, not defined by sameness of members. I mean, everybody who connects and become kin is us. That's the whole idea mm -hmm. of us relatives. So there is a connective to peer-to-peer -peer idea. The only thing is that it's much yeah. more breathing, it doesn't require yeah. sameness, uh, and it's, it's much more flexible, yeah. and uh, yeah. so there's no Absolutely. problem with the, yeah. on the contrary. Yeah. Um, I jump yeah. between you not, uh, when I say, I don't want to, I mean, yeah. when I su suggest to think in terms of peer-to-peer, -peer, I don't make any, any clear one-to-one -one analogy, not any more than we use property for, a stick that people, I mean, property for few stones, a few arrows that you find among, this is a huge stretch of the imagination to use the word property accumulation for the few things that hunter-gatherers have. So the, the same vocabulary that we use with great freedom and looseness, just in order to enable us to see something, uh, in the same way, I suggest peer-to-peer. -peer. Nothing like what you suggest, a very exact uh, analog between the two. And it means also about bodies. Peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, I, I don't say that hunter-gatherers have peer-to-peer -peer structures in the way we do, have, we do now here on Zoom or without bodies. On the contrary, they are the original peer-to-peer -peer societies. They have bodies, they connect, and Jerome have, and uh, Juliet Barriot have wonderful ethnography about people touching all the time, how proximate people are. There's a great deal of bodies and body-to-body -body mm -hmm. contact, not so much among Nayaka, but certainly among uh, people uh, uh, described by yeah. Jerome and Barry Juliet mm -hmm. and many others. Touching, close, very, being close to one another. So lots of bodies. So it's, to the contrary, it's not that hunter gathers have no bodies, but uh, unfortunately, in our digital uh, basis, we pay with bodies uh, by scalability, by zooms, by whatever. So they have bodies, and bodies are important, and that's the beauty of the kinship uh, metaphor, which we can't use anymore. And uh, peer to peer in the digital sense is just a very poor approximation of the kinship uh, ideal. Uh, Depoliticized. Uh, there's no chance that peer-to-peer uh, -peer will succeed the uh, uh, egalitarian hunting together, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> at the same time, at the same time, it's not hard to imagine uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, when the idea of peer-to-peer -peer will work, will be more realistic political project 
and purpose than equality. Mm. And if you speak about Trump, maybe peer-to-peer -peer can connect this diversity of people instead of splitting them into like Democrats, like uh, Republicans. I mean, the idea of like association on the basis of like creates mm. so many problems that peer-to-peer -peer mm. has something to offer even uh, on a political ground. Yeah. Um, mm. I think, ah, uh, the last point remaining, reverse dominance. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not familiar enough to, to relate to this yeah. question, but, but from what, what I picked from mm. you, it's uh, why do you take from me or why uh, you overbear me? I mean, like, yeah. with peer-to-peer, -peer, if someone takes from you, that's what hunter gatherers actually do. If someone yeah. takes too much from you, you hide what you have. You go away. You, yeah. you just... Yeah. But, but I, no, I get... Not from property, for, but from connection. So, yeah, so that, I'm not that sure fits, I buy it. That fits well with what was called counter-dominance. But reverse dominance is the idea that a group faces against someone who's trying uh -huh. to do... So I'm just wondering what process peer-to-peer -peer create, how does that work with peer-to-peer? -peer? Can peer-to-peer -peer gang together against someone who's being obnoxious? But that is they, they, they don't gang together the collective, but they definitely can stop uh, their contact with, uh, because right. they just, yeah. uh, again, I, I don't know. I, yeah. Airbnb just for okay. Uh, I, for I know. Easy, easy but in, in hunter just don't, don't contact them anymore. Mm. Uh, so yeah. they, because everything will everything hinge on connections. Disconnection mm. is a very easy option. Uh, yeah. You just disconnect. You don't yes. have to gang. You yeah. don't have to assemble yeah. a collective who will take a collective action with a leader or not with a leader or with mm. consensus or not. Yeah. You simply disconnect. Right. But then from, from my, just to put one last point, from, from like my perspective, how does that generate some, something like morality? If, I mean, where does, where is the sort of shared core of morality coming out of if, if it is all on, on the peer-to-peer -peer basis and without any kind of, kind of collective you know, gang? Because okay. um, there, there are, arguments in the evolutionary literature about the only way that that morality can come about is through warfare creating group against group um, now i don't believe that but i believe some version of an, a kind of group to group antagonism which might be gender group to group antagonism may be very important um, and peer-to-peer -peer does that capture that possibility is the part of the issue that i've got I offer the alternative of kinship morality. I think yeah. when mm -hmm. when you live with kin, yeah, it involves and you you do so you do so yeah. intimately for a mm -hmm. long time, and then you extend this kinship morality outwards to newcomers, to non to, to to lesser yeah. degree. But uh, I think kinship is uh, really the, uh, the, the it's really mm -hmm. the original mold of peer-to-peer, -peer, yeah. which much better, much more powerful, much more stronger, okay. more morally oh, oh. sound. Yeah. Uh, so I think kinship offer morality with outputs, yes. but yeah. with networks of kin. Okay. I've got one hand up that I can see, which is, um, oh, no, oh, all right, sorry, Jerome, you want to come in directly? Uh, oh. Yes. Yeah, if, if, sorry, Abiola. Um, it's just directly on this point, uh, if that's okay. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so one example very recently, which was fascinating of the peer-to-peer -peer networks is one called TikTok, which uh, some of you may know. I know through my 14-year-old daughter. Um, and uh, younger people are, especially uh, the sort of more awakened younger people, are very upset by some of the misogynistic language coming out of uh, the former, well, soon to be deposed president. And when he organized after, you know, the sort of, period of lockdown in, in a more, you know, very big corona crisis. He organized that major, um, uh, you know, uh, 
election campaign moment, uh, what all the TikTok kids did is they started to peer to peer ask each other to book places at the Trump rally. And they did so successfully that Trump thought he was having a, a sellout audience. And uh, when he turned up, they kept postponing because they're waiting for all these people to arrive, waiting for all these people to arrive. And they'd even set up huge screens outside the stadium expecting so many people. Oh, yeah. And of course, the place was empty and it was a great humiliation for him. So much so that within one week he had banned, wanted to ban TikTok, TikTok from the yes. United States. <laughs> Um, which is a dance music platform, basically, where kids lip sync to uh, their favorite pop tunes. Um, but anyway, as an example for Camilla of counter dominance, uh, sorry, of reverse dominance uh, happening through peer to peer networks, I think that that is a, is a lovely example. Okay, Abby? Yes. Um, oh. Oh, hold on. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Good evening. Oh, thank you very much, Nuri. Fascinating. Can we, can, we, can we see your face? Because it's nicer when we yeah. can look at each other. Uh, not really. I'm not oh, in the mood. All right. Never mind. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Um, thank you very much for provoking the discussion. And I just wanted to look at the um, egalitarianism and this peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer, from what I gather, for me anyway, is deeply superficial very much superficial that, and the issue I have is it doesn't actually deal with materialism that's really at the core of what's causing a lot of the problems the non-egalitarian problems it's a materialistic world and if we go to Airbnb for example that the example you use when I when I've used Airbnb I've only used it a few times not that many the when I've gone onto the platform, okay, I may connect with so many other people. The fact is, a lot of those properties I simply cannot afford. So within this sort of egalitarian peer-to-peer, -peer, you still have this hierarchy, which is, which is in, in a sense, is materialism because of all these nice houses. I just go for the cheapest because that's all I can afford. One day I might be able to afford something big, but the, the issue, the issue I'm trying to raise is that this peer-to-peer -peer this peer-to-peer -peer approach to egalitarianism doesn't work because it is only superficial and it can only deal at a certain level. On a much deeper level, it breaks down because of materialism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Abiola, go to private room Airbnb. It's wonderful, cheap and wonderful way of being with people. It's just absolutely <laughs> splendid. Uh, do. <clears throat> Hi. Hello. Yep, we can see you and hear you. Right here because I thought maybe it echoed a little. Um, so it's always fascinating to listen to Nuri, and I've been a fan of hers for a while, and we've also talked about this a little bit before that. Um, and, you know, listening to you, I, 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 I kept thinking that this is really the polar opposite of what uh, Graeber and Wengro are working right now, because they're all about scale uh, is inconsequential. We've always been political creatures, and you're really <laughs> going in, in the opposite argument. Um, to me, I, I don't know, the peer-to-peer -peer terminology, I, I'm not really sure that it is preferable to the kinship terminology. I remember we had a conversation uh, one time and you told me something like, this is what I remember from it, that we're all egalitarian in our families, with our families. And this insight and also the things that I've read in your papers really communicate to me directly what it means to be in a kind of kinship society because I could just imagine my own family and how we are. And there's demand sharing in my own family. There are leveling stuff in my own family. And that really brought home this idea, just thinking about my own family. When I think of peer-to-peer, -peer, for example, scale, which is very important to your theory, there's no limit in a peer-to-peer -peer society on scale. Um, when I think of examples of it, I do think there are more transactional. I don't see the aspect of collectivity um, so to me, I still 
prefer the critique of egalitarianism based on kinship. But I don't know, that's just one thought that I have. I really do wonder, what do you think peer-to-peer -peer adds over uh, uh, the, the, the critique that you have based on kinship? And, but also thinking back on this kinship critique, I was wondering, well, how do we discuss power struggles within kinship structures? Because also within the family, there are also power struggles. There are instances of, of coercion, for example, that also happens. So I wonder, even if we're thinking about it as a kind of kinship community, well, when do we start addressing this potential for coercion that eventually leads to the hierarchical societies that we are so desperately trying to explain? So I don't know if I phrased my questions very well. Yes, you did. Here are my thoughts. <laughs> Yotam, you want to ask, and I'll answer both because I keep seeing Yotam is trying to ask questions. Is there somebody else? Asked? Is there anybody else? I can't see anyone. Yeah. Your time, I can see your time oh, here. Actually, sorry, yeah, yeah. And I'll answer both. Uh, yeah, thank you, Nurit, for a very intriguing um, uh, talk. I was thinking um, in regards to also what Jerome uh, said and also what Chris said around um, the, when I'm thinking about Airbnb, uh, the Airbnb platform, it's actually, even if it is bringing like, let's say like peer to peer, or maybe a very, um, very narrow sense of kinship, um, then the kinship is of, of, of humans only. And there is, there is something to say when, when talking about also the body that th these are, these are like, there is something about like being very narrowly human that also eliminates uh, the body in many in many ways and also eliminates um, uh, eliminates uh, questions of 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 matter which are like about kinship with with a house or kinship with with um, with the space in which I live or the things that I uh, eat or the so there's a lot of something about the mediation that we live through it, which also is more apparent in Corona times than ever, that um, I'm thinking that the, can we, can we imagine uh, how we can expand this peer-to-peer -peer connection nowadays, or maybe that, and maybe that's the question I'm, give, I'm giving to you, like, can, can you imagine a way that this peer-to-peer -peer connection can go from the place that we're in to a place that includes the non-human, and I imagine that also includes then the more the immediate, like uh, the question of immediacy, as opposed to mediacy, um, uh, and and therefore includes the body. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, our little Israeli community, your <laughs> Israeli, I assume. Um, so the king. I, I prefer kinship community as a kind of a descriptive category when I deal only with hunter-gatherers. Kinship is a brilliant, brilliant structure. And I read it mathematically rather than as mother and father and mother is difficult and father beat me and whatever, a difficult family. I read kinship. In some sense, I think like the Vero de Castro perspectivism, kinship is is an ingenious perspective because it's, I'm a mother and a daughter and an uncle, uh, not an uncle, an aunt. Uh, so I'm relating to a whole range of people, each one in my own way. And my own way of relating to 10 people really dovetail with how they relate to each of us. It, it's ingenious system kinship. Uh, and if you look at it, so it's so many perspectives and link and constitution of identities and open-ended, I mean, as a structure, as a, a mathematical structure, it's really genius. And it comes with a morality and it comes with a not always functioning, and, but you know that a bad mother is a bad mother because you compare her with what you expect of mother to do otherwise. So there is a kinship morality. This said kinship is understood as we do, too, with too much body, with too much emotion, with too much uh, 
kinship is status, kinship is dual right. It's very difficult to think kinship the way hunter gatherers do. It really relates biology and stress affection and being together and whatever. So kinship community is by far my best, but I don't think it has analytical currency when you go beyond uh, and the gathers. So if I so if I try to say, okay, how to generalize this structure is egalitarianism and the uh, hierarchy doesn't give me the connections. It's difficult. And again, hierarchy and egalitarianism, you can understand it politically, but you can also understand it as a really mathematical structure. Egalitarianism, equality between members, hierarchy. Uh, so if you understand it in mathematical, lean, just structural way, then uh, neither is good for the heterogene heterogeneous, uh, connected, hyper-connected. So I use a peer-to-peer as better than uh, the two other options, but in no way again do I want to, I think on the contrary, hunter-gatherers can teach us what the peer-to-peer -peer could be because they have this ingenious system. The peer-to-peer -peer system as in Airbnb or any other, uh, there's lots of, lots and lots of platforms, sharing economy platforms. They're all very poor approximation, very corruptible, very, with very weak stitches. It's a, they have the, the idea of connections between uh, direct connections like hunter-gatherer kinship, but it's all full of loose ends and full of uh, problem, problematic areas. So, so, but, but kinship commute, uh, I mean, actually there are some uh, people who use a kin, uh, what's the name? Um, to kin, to kin the non-human species, non- Donna Harway? Yeah, yeah, Donna Harway. She speaks about kinning and to kin. So she used the idea of kinship, but again, it's a very difficult. Uh, it's analytical purchase is limited of kinship community because all of that we throw into it. I wonder if I could introduce a topic you haven't focused on too much this evening, which is scale. Um, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you, you, you mentioned um, Marshall Sarnins, um, and, and of, of course, you had a huge influence on David, Gra uh, David Graeber. And, 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 and David and David, the two Davids, Graeber and Wengro, yeah. have been really saying that hunter gatherers are of no particular interest to anyone because they're small scale societies. And we really want to be able to think in terms of what, what kind of evidence from anthropology might be relevant to people who live in cities and, and so they're very interested in early cities um, and I won't go into it all but um, I, I've actually always fought against the whole idea that hunter-gatherers are small scale and I know that's coming from a different place from where, from, from where you are but um, um, there's, a, there's, a, you, I, there's a basic principle in, in sort of fractal geometry invariance through transformations of scale and so you, you can have um, a local rule which you follow and follow and follow, rather like knitting, and you just do the same thing again and again and again, and it can produce a vastly complex uh, structure of kinship right across an entire continent, as of course in Australia. And the principle, of course, is the, un the underlying principle, ever so simple, it's just the equivalence of siblings. But if you keep on equating siblings with siblings with siblings down the, down the generations, you can have a far more grand scale of connectedness between people than anything ever achieved, achieved by the European Union, for example, or even the Roman Empire, actually. And, and, and many people have suggested that when, when humans got into, modern humans got into Europe, I mean, it does look as if the, the Venus figurines and so many other features of their iconography indicated a vast structure of like chains of connection, rather like across Australia, stretching right across the entirety of Europe and perhaps further. So <laughs> I'm just wondering what, why, why are your, I mean, obviously your particular, you know, the Nyaka, I mean, us are no doubt about it, small scale, but I mean, there seem to be so many hunter-gatherer societies who, 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 who use a classificator kinship system whose, whose ultimate logic is vast um, expanses of space embraced with 
you know, bonds of bonds of kinship. And it seems to me that's as interesting as, as uh, yeah. and of, co of course, when you have these massive systems where, where wherever you go, you can find hospitality because in some sense, they're your kin. That's not exactly kinship in the way you're, you're, you're stressing. You don't have to make those connections. I mean, those connections are there across Australia or across other places where these ar Arctic hunters and gatherers, like wherever you go, you'll find kin. Those are, those are there already, aren't they? They don't, you don't have to make, you have to make them real. You have to act on them. You have to, you know, to you know, embody those kinship connections. But there's, there's a sense in which those massive structures are there. And, the, and just one other last point, which is that I don't like the idea of, of simplicity. I don't, I mean, I know James, you quote, when you quoted James, you described him as saying these egalitarian societies like the Huds are the simplest forms of society you can arrive at. One, one of the wonderful things about um, um, uh, uh, Christopher Burm's work is he, he says there's nothing more complex and challenging for a, a basically a great ape where the default is going to be dominance of some sort, some, type of, some kind of hierarchy. There's nothing more challenging and extraordinary an achievement than to maintain what he, <laughs> egalitarianism through chains of connection of that sort. So to describe hunters and hunter-gatherers hunter as necessarily simple societies or small scale societies seems to me to be one side of the picture, which you're emphasizing, but just one side. <clears throat> I'm happy to go along with some of what you say, because I know I'm unclear sometimes about scale as just a simple measure, how many people there are or how big the society is. But this is a lapse in you know, a kind of an, I think scale is how you, for me, mostly scale is how, it's also the scale is limited. It's a, it's a good counter measure uh, to, 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 to stare away from analysis of hunter-gatherer society in terms of modern construction. So scale, scale brings to my small scale, nanoscale, I sometimes use, I don't know what to use, but nanoscale sometimes brings to mind that you need different ways to examine hunter-gatherers than a construct from modern society with its sameness and commensuration and the groups. I'm happy with a connection that expands outwards mm. to vast areas. I doubt if, if that, I, I'm happy with it. So the idea is connections and, and the inward, outward going connections. I don't know about the Australian again. I, I only remember um, for the Kung that when you go to another area that you don't know, you find a namesake. So if you find someone who is called Nuri, yeah. Then her brother, so your brother. So it's not, it's kinship logic, it's yeah. kinship scale in a way, but it's not quite what you describe. It's not that I no. sit here and I know all my kin connections everywhere. No. no. Uh, so it's yeah. somewhere. But in Australia, with the section and subsection systems and, and the song lines, I mean, there is there's no doubt there's an ex, no one's managing this. Obviously, it's completely egalitarian or bottom up. But yeah. there's no doubt that you could you could traverse the the continent pretty much from one you know from east to west, or the, uh, yeah. and and you arrive at some place where you don't know the language even, and they ask you, "What's your totem?" and you might say emu or, "Oh, here's your mother-in-law. These are your children. You can have sex with this lot, yeah. but you mustn't have sex with this lot. You're you're at home yeah. wherever you move because you can slot yourself into this extraordinarily expansive uh, you know web of, of of connectivity called kinship. But of course, that's kinship in a in a rather different sense. I mean, it's, these are as if you're your mother, as if you're your children, as if in some sense, but of course it's, it's made real by, by practice. Um, so I, I, I'm just so impressed with that. And that's, for me, it's a, quite an important argument against the Wengro David, um, the, Weng, the David Graeber and David Wengro's argument that hunter-gatherers are irrelevant to people living in cities, because I can't quite see why, in principle, you couldn't have a form of local organization of kinship and re residence along in streets, for example, which wouldn't be, so bonding and powerful that you wouldn't need a state, for example. There's no, they're right to say, I think, to say you don't need to have a sort of mayor and some sort of police force and sort to make a city work. But the only alternative to that would be something like what hunter gatherers do when they form chains of connection from the basis of their sort of household level of organization. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're close. Well, I think that's where peer to peer might come handy again. Yes, I can see that. Instead of a city as Scale is a scale, like you say, that the, the economic terms to do 
to produce things for scale, the, the strengths of a big scale. Yeah. When you, you go into scale as massive production, as yeah. massive replication, this is what I want to try. This is what for me scale means. Small right. scale is authentic, whatever. It's intimate, it's connection, it's personal life. And I think that and, and peer to peer, the digitally based peer to peer, you find it in streets. I don't know about you, but all my neighborhood now with the COVID, we are all with WhatsApp, which is peer to peer structure. Yeah. And we're all exchanging information and we buy this yeah. wonderful uh, vegetable from this producer who can sell it and whatever. So, so this technology helps precisely what you described. Yeah, it, it just needs real flesh and blood people with able to touch each other to enter into those peer to peer. -to -peer. Currently, I'm perfectly happy with you yeah. now, Chris. You're you're embodied <laughs> person for me now, even though I talk <laughs> with you. <laughs> I can't see any other hands up, but I mean, is that, does anyone else want to? We're getting a, well. We're eight eight o'clock. We sometimes finish around now. Um, that doesn't mean we have to. Um, I can't see any uh, anything else. Um, Jerome or Ingrid, would anyone like to sort of um say one more thing or comment, or shall we just ask Nurit to um. I don't know, sum up or something. <laughs> any, any, um, it's been a wonderful discussion. Um, very, very thought provoking. Um, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I have learned a lot this evening. Um, um, completely agree with what okay. Jerome said. But anyway, go on, Jerome. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, there are a couple of, in the chat, there are a few uh, questions which uh, nobody's raised. Catherine uh, Redfern mentioned um i don't know is she with us still would she like to ask the question it's a nice question catherine are you there catherine. hey yeah guys i'm here um i won't turn my connection it's not great um but i was just sort of thinking through the um the airbnb example that compares to some of the points that woodburn raised um and I'm just wondering where um, some of these sort of crucial tenets of egalitarianism, such as demand sharing, um, you know, are, enter in there. Um, someone else raised in the chat that, you know, maybe using a simpler uh, model, something like BitTorrent um, is a better model of peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking to use here. Um, but regardless, I, I think some of the, um, the aspects um, such as demand sharing um, don't don't appear to me to be evident um, in something like Airbnb. Um, and then I also, um, because you were, you started out by saying that uh, the model of egalitarianism um, doesn't leave room for um, animism and kinship, um, I wasn't quite clear how the peer-to-peer -peer network um, as a framework for thinking about this allows us to bring in those two um, elements. So maybe you could just speak to that a bit. Okay, thanks for, thanks for the comment. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer in that it shifts the emphasis from equality between separate members to connections between different members mm. encompass non-humans. I mean, equality, you, it's harder to say that, a, I don't know, a lion and a, and a human are equal. Mm. It's easier to say that both lions and uh, tigers, it's a, lions and people are in peer-to-peer -peer structures. I don't know, I, I, it's a little bit far stretch. But peer-to-peer -peer is, has scope for incorporating a great diversity because the connection matters and a very basic conformity, uh, basic conforming in a very basic way to a kind of general protocol. I mean, for example, Nayaka would speak to an elephant that come across to them and they speak to the elephant, don't come, uh, I won't do you harm, you go your way, I'll go my way. This is not equality, this is peer-to-peer, -peer, or it's a kind of, we both, they say literally, we both live in the forest, I'll, I'll 
take care of you, you'll take care of me, just go your way. The same, the, the same way they speak with snakes. So the idea of peer-to-peer, -peer, direct contact, consideration, irrespective of what exactly are on the notes of these connections, as long as they connect and they respect the connection, mm. encompass diversity, including non-humans. And it encompasses kinship because it's about connections. It's about connection. Kinship as well, it's connection between different people. By definition, kinship connects mother and father and baby and uh, grandmother. They're all essentially different by gender, age, uh, whatever. About Airbnb and demand sharing, again, when I speak about Airbnb, it's P-Airbnb. Okay, P-Airbnb is when you go into a house with, it's amazing how P Airbnb is overlooked when we speak about Airbnb, also in the older literature about Airbnb. And there is all sorts of, yeah, when you, you live with a, in, an, in a P and B or B with a family, there are all sorts of little, not quite demand, not the way Hunter Gathers do it, uh, certainly not, but there is expression of expectation to be given a breakfast or not, to be given space in the deep freezer or not. I mean, there's lots of negotiation about showing me that you care about me because I'll write a good review of you or whatever. <laughs> there's lots of a negotiation of showing concern and people do it in all sorts of ways. People, the host in PRBNB, they come and get you, they take you out, they, there are lots of uh, interplay, not as pronounced as demand sharing, but the same family. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like Airbnb um, has some aspects of, let's say, leveling mechanisms in the sense that, um, you know, anyone can participate, um, you know, whether you've got, you know, a little room in your basement or you know, or an entire apartment below you, you know, anyone can plug into the system. Um, so it kind of lowers the barrier to entry um, mm. in a way that, you know, we could think about as, as democratizing. Um, and, and I also agree with you just that the way that, I guess the added element of, you know, human to human direct, um, you know, humans, humans dealing with each other rather than through corporate structures, you know, anonymizing corporate structures, you know, it's, there's the warmth of human connectivity and the way that humans can, you know, everyone, each host can say, well, these are the rules in my house, you know, you can't have a party here, or you can't smoke weed here, or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, I, I personally, I really appreciate Airbnb. Um, and I, that's one of the reasons just that, you know, you, there is this injection of, of human warmth, um, and kind of a, a way to, to not quite redistribute resources because I don't think that there's quite that element, but we're bringing more resources that are needed into circulation. So I don't know, to me, I, I guess I feel like Airbnb has a lot of useful um, points to consider just in terms of how humans sort of um, negotiate space and rules, you know, in real time. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm not quite as convinced um, on the egalitarian aspects, um, but it's definitely food for thought. So thank you so much. I think we should possibly um, give Nira to break. She's been at it for quite a long time. It must be getting late over there. So thanks ever so much. It's been a really, very, very, very fruitful and, and lovely um, discussion. So much to think about. And so, um, thank you so much. Um, thank you for listening. And it's been lovely, lovely to talk with you. And even on right. Zoom, spend yeah. time with you. Yeah, so right. yeah, it does feel quite um, small scale and familiar and therefore rather lovely. <laughs> okay, okay, everyone. So, okay. I, I would like Camilla yeah. and John to send me the reference you mentioned about the uh, content, about what, what, what? I'll write to you separately. Reverse yeah. dominance, counter dominance. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's a rabbit on the screen my, on my screen. Uh, this is uh, peer to peer. Yeah. Oh, a peer to peer. Hello, hello, Jack. <laughs> hello. hello. Um, and just to announce, of course, um, as far as I remember, it's, it's Jerome. It's your next week, aren't you? As far as I know. Um, next two. Next, next two your, Yes. Okay. Yes, everybody.
etc. Please, could you send me a link also to Jerome's talk? Yes, it'll be the same as this one. It, never, the link, it, it will be this one. The, link, the, same, the link is the, the same? same? The, same, the same number, that's right. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, uh, okay. Goodbye then, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you.